Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Mass Spectrometry, Past and Present, Emerging Technologies and Strategies for Quality Management in Today's Clinical Laboratory, presented by Dr. Sazade, Dr. Orton, and Dr. Boyd from Alberta Precision Laboratories. I'm Benjamin Dugas, Global Senior Marketing Manager for Clinical Diagnostics at Waters Corporation, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Waters Corporation. For more information on our clinical solutions, please visit us at waters.com forward slash clinical. At Waters, we understand that clinical diagnostics is more than collecting data, it's making a difference in someone's life. This is why we provide clinical LCM SMS solutions that you can trust in every step of the way. Now let's get started. I'd like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time that you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. Additionally, we'll be conducting a few polls and appreciate your participation. In fact, we're gonna send out the first poll now. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing educational credits. So following this presentation, those credits can be obtained by clicking on the tab at the right, top right and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our three presenters from Alberta Precision Laboratories. Dr. Sazadeh is currently the Clinical Section Chief of Biochemistry at Alberta Precision Laboratories, as well as the Clinical Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Calgary. Dr. Sazadeh is a widely recognized clinical chemist and scientist who has authored, authored over 220 peer-reviewed articles book chapters, model graphs, abstracts, and co-editor of a book. He also directs clinical projects aimed at developing new markers and methods using LCMSMS technology, of which he has implemented in different laboratories in the past 20 years. Dr. Orton is a clinical biochemist overseeing the Mass Spectrometry Testing Laboratory in Calgary for Alberta Precision Laboratories. Excuse me as well as an assistant professor at the University of Calgary. His current research involves the development of LCMSMS assays to elucidate a greater understanding of individuals' responses to drug therapy and pharmacokinetics. Dr. Boyd is a clinical biochemist at Alberta Precision Laboratories and clinical associate professor at the University of Calgary. She is the co-director of the Analytical Toxicology Laboratory, which includes mass spectrometry testing for urine drugs of abuse, therapeutic drug monitoring, and endocrine markers. For a complete biography on all of our presenters today, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to our presenters to start the present presentation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sanzadeh, Thanks, Ben. Hello, everybody. In this presentation, we will discuss the history of MassSpec, compare the strengths and weaknesses of different types of MassSpec, and understand the necessary quality metrics required to ensure assay quality and meeting the standards. The first part of this uh, presentation will cover a brief review of the history of MassSpec. Many scientists had significant impact on the development of MassSpec. However, due to limited time, today I will not be able to acknowledge the work of all of them. So I will briefly describe the uh, work of some of the key contributors to this uh, field. Although it was originally used 
in the field of physics more than a century ago, mass spec has revolutionized the practice of laboratory medicine in the past two decades. Mass spec is an extremely powerful technology that can identify and quantify any molecule by ionizing that molecule and measuring the mass to charge ratios of its generated ions. Mass spec is currently the most specific and sensitive technique in clinical laboratory, and mass spec will continue to positively impact the practice of laboratory medicine in all its disciplines. The history of mass spec starts with Joseph John Thompson, a physicist who was given an outstanding opportunity at the famous Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University in England. He was a 28-year-old brilliant theoretical physicist who, for the first time, was given an experimental position in that excellent institution. At that time, transmission of electricity through gases was a hot topic, and Thompson chose that topic for his research, and his assistant, E. Everett, was extremely important and had significant role in successful completion of the experiments in that laboratory. In 1897, Thompson measured charge to mass ratio of some atoms. Please note that early physicists reported charge to mass ratio, not mass to charge ratio as we currently do. Two years after that discovery, Thompson built an instrument that could measure not only charge over mass, but also charge simultaneously, and therefore he was able to measure the mass of electrons. Thompson received Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering electrons in uh, 1906. Here, you also see the picture of Aston, one of Thompson's associates, which I will describe his work in next slides. The early work by Thompson laid the foundation for the field of mass spec. Thompson and his protege, Francis William Aston, in 1919, built the first mass spec to measure the mass of uh, charged ions. Aston was able to identify 212 of 287 naturally occurring isotopes by the mass spec at that time, which was quite an accomplishment. He continued to improve his mass spec resolution and by 1927, Aston's mass spec was accurate to more than one part in 10,000. Aston himself received Nobel Prize in Chemistry in uh, 1922. You can see the neon 20 and 22 ions at the uh, lower right corner. And here is the picture of the replica of the third mass spec made by Thompson. In early 1940s, an electrical engineer from physics department at the University of Minnesota by the name of Alfred Neer started his significant contribution to this field by simply bringing this technology, meaning mass spectrometry, to other scientists. Neer was a modest gentleman and ready to share his knowledge with other scientists. He built 
several major instruments, including 60 degree sector field mass spec. And with E.J. Johnson, he built the Near Johnson mass spec. Near also helped biologists by preparing C13 enriched carbon for them to use as tracer. He measured lead isotope for geochemists so they can determine the age of the Earth. Near also contributed to Manhattan Project by uh, separating uranium-235 from uranium-238 for Enrico Fermi. As you know, Enrico Fermi was a top scientist for uh, Manhattan Project. In early 1940s, physic physicists did not know which uranium isotope was responsible for neutron fission. Near was able to separate few nanograms of uh, uranium-35 isotopes. And then he sent that to John Donning's laboratory at Columbia University. And uh, Professor Donning was able to confirm that uranium-235 was indeed the isotope responsible for fission and can be used to make atomic bomb. Up to 1940, mass spec was mostly used by physicists and industrial chemists. No one really tried to understand what went on inside that black box. In mid-1950s, three chemists started to use mass spec in their research and tried to better understand this technology. Brett McLafferty focused on the mass spec instrumentation and methodology. He established the roles and languages of mass spec with compounds of known structure. Plus Beeman from MIT used mass spec on alkaloids and peptides and was among the very first to show that mass spec can be used to identify the structure of unknown complex natural compounds. Carl Gerasi uh, was an established scientist at Stanford University who focused uh, mostly on the steroids and terpenoids and came to the field of mass spec uh, later than the other two gentlemen. In uh, 1960, Jurassi invited Professor Beeman to go to Stanford and help him set up a mass spec lab and continued his research on steroids using mass spec after that. It wasn't until the 1980s that mass spec was used in the clinical laboratory. In 1981, a military plane crashed on an aircraft carrier and the pilot's urine tested positive for marijuana. In response to that accident, President Reagan enacted a zero tolerance for drugs of abuse in the military, which then required testing. At that time, drugs of abuse were tested by immunoassays. Immunoassays in general are not very specific and can generate false positive results that must be confirmed by a mass spec assay. And at, in uh, 1980s, gas chromatography mass spectrometry was mostly in clinical toxicology lab. Thus, this requirement of testing for con and confirming the positive results drove mass spec in toxicology laboratory. By 1980, although scientists could ionize small molecules 
and measure them in mass spec, they could not ionize large molecules like proteins and other complex carbohydrates without being uh, breaking them and fragment them in different pieces. In 1988, scientists at different parts of the world and almost at the same time developed different technologies to ionize large molecules such as proteins. John Fenn and his team at Yale University discovered electron spray ionization. Also, Koishi Tanaka, who was an engineer at Shimatsu Company in Japan, with the help of his research team, was able to successfully ionize large proteins using laser desorption. Johnson and Koichi Tanaka shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry by 2002, and it was given to them for their development of soft desorption ionization method for mass spectrometric analysis of biological macromolecules. At the same time that Finn and Tanaka were working on protein ionization. Two German scientists from the University of Frankfurt, Franz Hillenkamp and Michael Karras, were also working on protein ionizations. They used different technology called laser microprobe mass analyzer that helped them successfully ionize large protein molecules. They call their new technique matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, or MALDI for short, and published it in 1985. These advancements made mass spec much more user-friendly and provided great opportunity to all scientists to finally be able to use this technology without devoting their careers working on different techniques. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, because of the time limitation, I could not cover the work of all the great scientists who one way or other contributed to the development of mass spectrometry. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to mention them all. It was not intentional. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And now I'll pass this to my colleague, Dr. Jessica Boyd. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sassaday. So my section of the talk will be on the basic principles of mass spectrometry and the applications of this technology in the clinical lab. So this slide just shows some of the applications that mass spec is currently used. You can see that there are many applications currently in use in chemistry. And of course, in microbiology, mass spec is used for bacterial identification. If you were to boil down mass spec to its most basic components, you can kind of put it into four different boxes, which I've put here. Of course, at the beginning, you need, usually need to do some kind of sample preparation in order to clean up the matrix, concentrate the analyte, or put the sample into a form that can be introduced into the mass spec. This can be done online or offline. Then, when the sample is ready, we need to ionize it so that it can be seen by the mass analyzer. The mass analyzer itself is then able to filter the ions so that we can control which ones are actually hitting the detector at any given time, which then provides us the data that is so useful and that we would then analyze and put in a form that is reportable to physicians. I'm going to go through these three blue boxes here very quickly over the next few slides, starting with sample introduction. So this slide uh, shows some of the ionization types that are present in the clinical lab, and you'll see that I have organized them by the state that the sample is in. 
In the top line, we have gas chromatography. Typically here, we're using either electron impact or chemical ionization um, sources. And the EI in particular has been used uh, to great effect for uh, analysis of drugs of abuse in urine. Liquid chromatography is really coming into vogue in the clinical chemistry laboratory, and in my lab, for example, this is what we're using most commonly, coupled to an electrospray ionization source. Um, of course, we have other options, such as an APCI source, which are used for analytes that are more lipophilic and perhaps don't ionize as well with ESI. And then finally, we also have solid state um, analysis, and a good example of this is uh, MALDI. So just to spend a minute on electrospray ionization, because it is so prevalent in clinical chemistry, um, on the left is a diagram of how ESI works. Um, at, you'll see on the very left that there's a tube with liquid spraying out of it, and this is the ESI capillary that is coupled to the end of your LC system. In the mobile phase, a modifier and pH adjustments should be done so that your analyte is ionized, and then a a uh, current or voltage can be applied to the ESI capillary so that it nebulizes that sample, uh, forming droplets containing charges, and you can see that at the bottom of the picture. Then within the source, drying gas and heat can be applied to evaporate the solvent so that ultimately, and ideally, what you have entering the mass spec are single individual desolvated ions. Compared to MALDI, where we have a solid sample, here in this picture, you can see we have our analyte uh, depicted with green circles, and it's embedded in an ionizable matrix, which is depicted by the blue circles. When a laser is pointed at this mixture, the ionizable matrix will ionize, and it will transfer its charge to our analyte of interest so that it is able to enter the mass spectrometer and uh, be analyzed. So now we'll move on to the mass analyzers. So it's important to remember that mass analyzers manipulate ions, and so that's why we need to make sure that we have a good ionization source sitting in front of our mass spec. There are many different types of mass analyzers available, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, today, I will only be able to touch on quadrupole and time of flight analyzers. And we're also able to put mass analyzers in series to form a tandem mass spectrometer, and this really increases options for the types of scans that we can do to look at fragmentation patterns, and this really gives mass spec its edge in terms of having higher specificity uh, compared to other uh, methods we might use in the clinical chemistry laboratory. Just to show how this fragmentation um, patterns and can be used to help identify uh, analytes, here I'm showing a GC electron impact spectra of cocaine. Now, electron impact is a hard ionization source, so we get fragmentation of the uh, parent ion in the source. And so when all those ions move to the mass analyzer, you can see that we have a mixture of parent cocaine as well as very fragments of cocaine. Now, we know that if we always apply the same voltage in EI, that we're able to actually reproduce the spectra every single time we do that analysis, both in terms of what's produced and the intensity of what's produced. And so for GCMS, this has been pivotal in helping us produce libraries that can then be used to help us identify drugs, for example, in patient samples. In LCMS, although we don't necessarily have the same kind of library system that we do for GC, you know that when you do your method validation and you determine what a collision energy is for a triple quad, for example, that if you apply that same collision energy under the same conditions every single time, you will be producing the same uh, fragment ions and intensities, and we can use that as an extra layer to help identify uh, compounds in our samples. So this is a picture of a quadrupole mass analyzer, and of course it gets its name from the configuration of the four rods on which electrical fields are applied so that we can affect the trajectory of ions through the rods. In clinical labs, and particularly in my lab, for example, we see this in a triple quadrupole uh, configuration, and so there's a picture here at the bottom of the slide. You can see that there are three quadrupoles in series. The Q1 and Q3 are what we use as a mass filter, and Q2 is used as a collision cell so that we can fragment um, ions coming in from Q1. The scan type that we use almost exclusively in many labs is called multiple reaction monitoring, um, and using a triple quadrupole, how that would work, 
is that in Q1, we would select for the parent ion of a particular you know, compound or drug, for example. We would then send that into Q2 and fragment it with nitrogen or argon gas. And then in Q3, we would select at least two, usually, um, fragment ions that we would then monitor and send to the detector. Each of these combinations of a parent and a fragment ion are called an MRM transition. And like I said, we usually monitor at least two of these for every analyte in our method. To give you an idea of what that looks like practically, this is um, a snippet of one of our reports from an LCMSMS MRM uh, drug screen method that we run in my lab. And this is for benzalecanine, which is a, a major metabolite of cocaine. Um, and so uh, we have three pictures here. The first is uh, a chromatogram of what we would call our quantifier chromatogram or a quantifier MRM transition. And this is a transition that we would have identified during method validation as often the, the highest intensity one, but not always. And so you can see at the top of that box, it says 290.1 to 168.1. So that is the transition we're monitoring. And so our staff would look at this, um, of course, assess the chromatography and the retention time to determine whether we think um, uh, this is uh, acceptable to, uh, for benzalecanine identification. But we don't stop there. We would then go to the second box, and this is actually an overlay of the chromatograms from two MRM transitions. So again, if you look at the top of that box, you'll see our quantifier transition of 290.1 to 168.1, but you'll also see one in blue that is 290.1 to 105.1, and this is our qualifier MRM. And we use this as an extra confirmation to determine whether our drug is actually present in the sample. Um, based on how we set up the software for this particular um, assay, you can uh, we've asked the software to actually normalize the two chromatograms so that if we have uh, a good match between the two, they should actually overlay and it should actually look like one line and that's actually what it looks like here. If benzalecanine was not present in this sample, it would be quite clear if there were, um, because we would have two lines visible and they wouldn't overlay at all, we'd have different bumps and lumps and things. This is also helpful to identify if you have a co-eluting compound in your chromatogram or one of the um, one of the MRM transitions, so one of these might appear to have a bump on it that the other doesn't. And then, of course, in the third um, box, we have an MRM transition monitored for our internal standard, which in this case is benzalecanine D3. Here's a picture of a time of flight mass analyzer. And so the difference here is that uh, it contains a flight tube where um, ions are actually going to fly through. They'll go to the bottom and be reflected by a reflectron and then come back and hit the detector, which is on the right-hand side there. Um, the act, mass is measured in this analyzer um, based on the time it takes to do this transit, and smaller ions are able to do this faster than larger ones. So by measuring the time of transit, we are able to then calculate the mass of that original ion. Now, of course, TOF is often coupled with MALDI uh, for use in the clinical microbiology lab, and so here's just a picture putting that all together. You can see on the left we have our sample culture, which would then be mixed with the blue matrix and then spotted onto a MALDI-TOF sample plate. That plate, if you then look in the picture on the right, can be introduced into the TOF instrument, um, hit with a laser beam, and then you can see the ions going through the flight tube to the detector. There's also um, some other areas that are interested in using MALDI for uh, use in the clinical lab, particularly in histology. And so here's an example of where um, we would be able to analyze tissue sections on a slide um, using MALDI to add extra information in terms of protein composition and localization within a slide um, that would add extra information for the pathologist in addition to other his conventional histology staining. So just to finish, I wanted to go through a few things that we found very helpful uh, to consider when implementing new mass specs in our lab or new mass spec methods. Uh, first off, of course, selection of the mass analyzer will depend on what you want to measure with it and the type of data desired, whether you want to do full scans on everything or a targeted approach may influence what you would get. Uh, one of the major 
benefits of mass spec is that you can analyze many analytes together simultaneously from one sample. However, keep in mind that everything you add to a method adds complexity in terms of running the method, maintaining the method, and doing the data analysis. And so you need to determine whether that's going to be useful or not to do that. Method validation is different than what you would do for a general chemistry analyzer, and that's whether you're doing it as a lab developed test or evaluating a kit method from a company. And there will be more information on that in the third part of the talk. Staff training often takes longer as the instruments in the data analysis are more manual than automated chemistry analyzers, although we're now starting to see some solutions to help, with, particularly with the data analysis. And finally, don't forget about the post-analytical part. Interfacing to the laboratory information system can significantly improve your workflow and your turnaround time, and you should always consider it when putting a mass spec or a new method into your lab. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Orton. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Dennis Orton. I am the clinical biochemist that oversees the LCMS testing lab uh, in Calgary uh, for APL. And I'm going to focus this part of my talk uh, primarily on LCMS methods. So Jessica reviewed quite a few different applications, but the LCMS is definitely uh, kind of the, the workhorse of the, uh, of the clinical lab at the moment. So I thought I would just go over some of the applications and quality metrics that we should be monitoring therein. And as, um, you know, these, these kit methods become available and I, LCMS becomes available in more and more labs, I feel like it's really important to focus on, uh, you know, the, the vendor may be trying to sell you a kit method with, um, you know, if, you've seen the, if you've seen the matrix, you kind of understand what I mean, where what they're selling you is the blue pill, but what you're actually getting is the red pill. And my, my own personal experience would lead me uh, to take the blue, blue pill every time. But, um, yeah, so we'll just talk about some of the LCMS applications that, uh, that we have in our, in our lab. Um, okay, so... Um, Basically, there's, there's so many different aspects of an, of an LCMS method that you can measure. You can measure every single uh, parameter of a peak uh, that you could ever imagine. You can look at, you know, the asymmetry. You can look at the, uh, the retention times and the, uh, whether or not it's tailing, peak width, et cetera, et cetera. But what quality metrics should we re really be monitoring is kind of the, the big question. And so I, I'm just going to run through kind of some of the things that I've found uh, in my experience are, are the most helpful and get the most bang for your buck. And so it, within every run, you're going to always want to focus on, on looking at things like the retention time, the ion ratios that Jessica was talking about in the previous section. Um, and then also there's things that are important, like the internal standard peak area, pressure plots, peak shape. Those are all really important things to pay attention to throughout the course of a single run. Um, and I'll show you some examples of why, why that's important and what you can do to potentially uh, do something about it. But then also day to day, we, uh, we run some system suitability samples. You should track like your peak areas. Uh, you should look specifically at whether or not the signal to noise ratio is changing over the course of your, um, you know, the age of your, your method or your column or your solvents. And then I'll talk a little bit about the QC results that we're expecting. Um, <clears throat> okay, so setting yourself up for success. Basically, before you start any run, uh, it's always important to run some, some system suitability samples. Just, just running several consecutive injections of a standard that was made in pure solvent. It doesn't need to have any kind of um, preparation or anything like that. It's just basically checking to make sure your system is functioning before you start your run. Um, we generally say within our lab, especially if you have a, a decent uh, run time, you know, if it's like a five-minute run time, you should be able to get 10, 10 injections just to make sure your system is actually up and functional, but you may want to do fewer than that if you have a really long run time. So some of the metrics that we look at, retention time. So if your retention time is highly variable injection to injection, you can look at whether or not your column is degrading, degrading whether or not you have the, the correct column on. Uh, whether or not your column's even connected. So sometimes you know you forget to actually plug the column into the system, and so you don't waste an entire run. Um, you can stop it now and be like, oh yeah, forgot about that, and then do it. Um, you can make sure that your your solvents are mixing well. Uh, there's no major leaks within the system. So if you see a, a retention time that's bouncing around quite a bit, then that's uh, that's definitely uh, some sort of leak somewhere in your system. Um, the column equilibration is also really important. So if your solvents uh, aren't being given time to re-equilibrate, you may 
Like if you have a really unstable retention time, you may just have to add you know, 30 seconds on the tail end of your method to make sure that it, uh, it actually equilibrates between injections. Uh, the pressure plot is a hugely important thing. So this will actually detect things like minor leaks. So a lot of the time your retention time may actually be stable and reproducible, uh, even though there is a small leak somewhere. And I find that you know, things like purge valves can get loose and those kinds of things. So it's really important to kind of track what your pressure currently is when you're starting. And this is something that you'll, you'll find when you're setting up the method in the lab, that this is something you have, to, you have to actually monitor day to day and make sure that, you know, if your back pressure does increase over time, you could have, you know, dirty lines or plug guard columns, that kind of stuff, and, and that can affect your chromatography. And so you, all you have to do is just switch out the guard column or, or flush a line and you get better uh, uh, signal intensity. Um, so the other things with the system suitability, so we actually track our signal intensity day to day, and this helps kind of not only monitor the, the chromatography, but also the, the solvents themselves. So if you only run a, a method once a week, then, um, you know, your solvents can go bad real, real quick. Uh, your column can degrade, which can cause issues. Uh, the mass spec stability is big, uh, especially if, to, if you have to do things like auto-tunes or, or calibrations or whatever periodically. It's important to kind of understand um, how your signal to noise is changing over time. Also, any like vacuum leaks, ion transfer issues, um, voltage application, these kinds of things are all kind of things that uh, you have to worry about when you're running the method. So, system suitability sample can look many different ways. So, if I pretend like this is a, a situation where I've just, I'm just injecting a series of system suitability samples over and over and over again within the same batch, uh, and if you see some sort of transition of, of peak from nice nice and pretty and sharp and good retention time to more blobby and then finally the signal just basically drops off and you got nothing. Um, so this could indicate anything from column degradation to loss in performance. Usually this is going to be a solvent mismatch or a lack of column equilibration. So again, just give it a little bit more time in between um, your, um, your actual gradient and the, re re the next injection. Um, this can also be caused by a back pressure increase. So if you have injected a, a sample and it's uh, kind of cruddy, uh, your system suitability sample should be made up in a matrix that's very similar to the solvent that you're actually running through your system at the time. So if you're injecting, you know, pure methanol, then it could cause, you know, precipitation of, of, your, of your solvents or, or, or your buffers in your solvents or something along those lines within your system, which can plug it and cause these kinds of problems. So it's just really important to kind of, you can see these kinds of things coming, like you could actually stop it at, at, you know, in the middle pane here. So if you have your nice sharp peak normally, and then you see that it's kind of blobby and no good, you don't have to wait for, you know, the 10th injection of the system suitability to stop it and, and do some intervention and actually get, get to it in a timely way. So conversely, you can have the exact same pattern of, uh, of the uh, peak areas, but with a nice pretty peak. Um, and so this again can be, it's usually related to solvents or, or columns. Uh, improper sample preparation, it could be something wrong with your injection valve or there's a, a small leak somewhere in the system that's causing your, your sample not, to not get efficient, efficiently loaded onto the, uh, onto the column. So this one is an especially frustrating situation. If your peak still looks good, but your peak area is completely dropped off, it can be extremely frustrating to try to troubleshoot that. But um, Generally, it's going to be something like your solvent pH is not stable, or uh, it could be the, the mass spec itself has is, is got a vacuum leak somewhere. Uh, it could be the, um, the samples not being injected properly and those kinds of things you have to check into. So when you're monitoring the internal standard over the course of the run, and this is, this is very important to, to kind of derive what your acceptability criteria are during validation. And I'm not... This, it's, not, it's kind of without the scope of this talk for me to talk about how to validate, how to set up a mass spec method as a lab developed test. My focus is more the quality metrics that you should be trying to keep track of, both during clinical validation as well as during uh, operation. So you kind of have to come up with some acceptability criteria for your internal standard uh, injection to injection um, to track your chromatographic consistency, to track whether or not you have trends or issues with your, with your sample, especially in the absence of analyte. So this is really important for things like drugs and abuse testing, where you're not going to have drugs. Not every patient sample you're testing has all of the drugs in your panel all the time. So it's really important to have internal standards kind of scattered throughout your, your chromatogram so you can actually make sure that your solvents are mixing well and your, your sample is being injected properly, those kinds of things. 
um, you really do have to make specific note of your calibrators and QC material, and I'll show you an example of why that is in a moment. Uh, but matrix effects can really alter your extraction efficiency or your ion suppression profile. So if you're running your calibrators and they're not representative of your patients, then you really have to question what you're actually doing with your sample prep. Um, you can see variation in the, in the internal standard uh, due to ion suppression or chromatographic problems. Generally, uh, it's important to make note of this during your validation again, and I'll talk about this in a moment, is if your internal standard is being suppressed uh, by, your, by your parent molecule, then it's very important to kind of understand, like if your target analyte overlaps with your internal standard as it, as it should, um, then you're gonna see some suppression of your internal standard when, you're, um, when your target molecule is quite high in abundance. Uh, so it's just very important to kind of understand how your assay actually functions because that would be a part of your linearity experiment. Okay, so further on to the internal standard. So basically wh what I showed you before was an okay example. Uh, this is a bad example of what an internal standard should not look like. So trends are highly undesirable. And this is something that I've encountered several times in my current lab where we have um, just some minor ongoing issues um, that need to be cleaned up. So if you see something like you can see here in the first 10 injections or so, these are the calibrators and QC material. And then from injection number 10 on, and this is in the left panel, you can see that it's highly variable. The internal standard response is all over the place, but there's also kind of a trend start to finish. It's, it starts high and ends low. And when I pulled the data, I found that this was actually reproducible run to run, day to day, batch to batch, and everybody just kind of accepted this as normal. But it is not, it's, it's basically bad practice because you've got, you know, your calibrators are running different than your, than your patient samples, obviously. But there's also something obviously different with your patient samples. There's something, something you're injecting in your patient samples that's causing differences in your chromatography over time. And then when you see on the right panel, um, this abnormal, this, you should have seen this coming. Like people were shocked that this happened. Like, no, no, you needed to see this coming from your day-to-day -day monitoring of your internal standard response. You know that it's dropping over time, and then just all of a sudden one day you have precipitation on the column or your guard column gets plugged or whatever, and that causes this problem. But the main thing is if this is what your internal standard pattern looks like, you really do have to address it using either sample preparation, different chromatography, something along those, something is wrong, and so it's important to address it before you have such a big problem as you see on the, the right. So the question of can QC help? Um, of course, yeah, Q QC can help, uh, but how often to run it really depends on lots of different factors. Uh, how many repeats your lab can tolerate if something goes wrong is a big thing. Um, so if you're running a 10 minute drug screen method, then uh, obviously you wanna run your QC a little bit more, maybe a little bit more often because you don't wanna have to repeat you know, dozens of, of patient samples at 10 minutes a run. If it's a two minute run, you maybe can run your QC a little bit more flexibly. Um, the biggest question is, does the quantitative result actually reflect the underlying problem? Like the, what problems are you actually trying to does, like figure out here? If you're, if you're tracking just the, the quality control um, quantitative result, then it's important to kind of keep in the back of your mind that you're not actually looking at what could be the actual problem. So when you're troubleshooting your QC failures, that's something that you definitely need to pay attention to. The arbitrary recommendation is that you run uh, QC every 10 patient specimens. I think this comes from uh, basically GLP practices. Um, and there's no real reason for it other than uh, it's a good number, it's a nice round number, and it seems like it works pretty well. But again, if you have a highly, uh, if you have a very high throughput method every, every two minutes, you're injecting a new patient sample and maybe you don't quite need to do it every 10 patient specimens and maybe even the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and again, does your QC actually reflect patient specimens? So if you have uh, lab-prepared QC that maybe has a little bit more organic solvent in there because that's how you had to make it, and you have a very different uh, recovery from your QC than you do from your patient samples, um, you kind of have to ask yourself that question. If your QC is not reflecting your patient samples, then running it periodically, does that really change anything? Um, it's also re really common to run a calibration curve at the beginning and end of an LCMS batch. Um, and this will kind of let you know if there's big differences in chromatographic performance or LCMS performance or whatever, but between, between runs and, uh, or within the run. And that's really important, I think, but it, the question of which calibration curve do you use when they're, when they're different, um, that's, that's one of those things where you kind of have to address that during your validation, your clinical validation, 
and come up with the, the acceptability criteria. And in that case, you would have to use your QC that you've run throughout your batch. So on to ion ratios. So ion ratios are the classic triple quad uh, quality metric, as Jessica mentioned. This is like your fingerprint, right? So if I have the right retention time, the right ion ratio, the right peak shape, all is well. I can say with high confidence that this is indeed benzylethamine, for example. Um, but the acceptability criteria generally use peak area, and peak area can be influenced by a number of different factors. So if you have an overlapping peak, uh, some interference that's overlapping with your analyte of interest, and you see your qualifier peak is way higher than your quantifier and it shouldn't be, then obviously that's an interference, that's a problem. But whether or not that's a suppression of your quantifier and an increase of your qualifier or vice versa is a, is a question you kind of have to address. And um, that's, that's kind of its own problem because I don't think that modifying your chromatogram would actually get rid of this. You may have to address this during sample prep. What's more common is you get these shoulders on your qualifier. And the dangerous thing about this is if you just rely on the iron or the uh, the, the iron ratio itself, it's a peak area ratio, then you may actually miss this because um, these areas may actually turn out to be just coincidentally the same as your, your analyte of interest, but clearly there's something overlapping there and that's gonna be a problem. So really use of iron ratios requires an understanding of your expected peak shape for both the quantifier and the qualifier. Uh, it's possible to still report the result if only the qualifier is affected by this interference. Um, but you really do have to do a little bit more checking into that, and that may require, you know, repeat testing, uh, new extractions, checking your solvents, et cetera, et cetera. If failure is common, you may want to look at uh, adjusting your sample preparation or chromatography, like use a new column, uh, have a confirmation method, those kinds of things. But if all else fails, you can actually add a second or third qualifying ion that can be used when the primary ion fails. And again, all you have to do is just run through and make sure that these kinds of interferences don't, um, don't overlap with all of those, those uh, secondary, third, tertiary kind of uh, quality or qualifier ions. So the question about uh, external quality assurance or proficiency testing, um, obviously this is just the same as any other, uh, any other assay, any other chemistry assay. Uh, it prevents drift over time due to unidentified changes in your assay performance. So you just make sure you're not wandering too far from a peer group. Um, pretty much all your stereotypical uh, PT providers have LCMS options. Um, CATS, LGC, uh, One World uh, are a few of the providers that I've used. Um, but you'll notice if, if you've been running these things, acceptability criteria are often very, what I'm going to call friendly. So the, the uh, criteria are not very stringent. Um, and so that's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Like really, if you are doing your own internal quality checks sufficiently, if you're checking your lot to lot variation in your calibrators and your QC, you should never really fail. Um, but the, the number one failure we do have is matching units. And so because we are in Canada and lots of those uh, proficiency testing labs are in, are in the US, um, we have to convert our units and we always you know, miss a miss a decimal or don't carry a one or whatever. Um, and so this is where coming in, it, it, it's really important to set your acceptability criteria around prepar preparation of calibrators or even bringing in external, um, you know, like a commercially available calibrators and QC material. It's a good idea to get them either separate lots or from different vendors. Whether or not you're making them yourself or, or not, it's not really important. It's important to get as much variability in there as you can so that you really uh, aren't reliant on a single vendor um, wherever possible to be able to catch if there's any changes in your chromatographic or LCMS performance over time. So just a, uh, a note on the validation. Um, I don't want to go too deep into this because again, this isn't really a, a focus on, on the, the validation side. So there's CLSI guidelines available for clinical method validation. So these things cover pretty much everything you can desire. Um, but for LCMS, a clinical method validation, and I'm not talking about the development side with you know, picking your ions and everything like that. I'm talking about um, the, the clinical side. So you really do just need to shift your focus a little. You do the same exact experiments as you do with any other clinical method evaluation, whether like it's a ammonia or AST, um, but you have to focus differently. And so this is gonna be shifting focus onto the peak areas 
the uh, reproducibility thereof. So when you do your linearity experiments, you want to make sure that your internal standard peak area is, uh, is not being suppressed too much. Uh, you can purposely adjust your internal standard peak area to, uh, to compensate for that and actually shift your linear uh, range if you need to. Uh, you have to focus on matrix effects. Obviously, during manual sample prep, there's a lot of issues surrounding that, and unexpression experiments um, using the post-column infusion is a good way to go about that. Um, precision experiments, so this is going to have to, uh, it's very important to kind of focus on both your peak area as well as your, your quantitative results. So if you have an internal standard and an analyte that uh, behave differently during your extraction, then your precision experiment needs to look at the the difference in your uh, peak areas. And so when you see a high CV, a percent CV of the analytical result, uh, that may actually just be a due, due to uh, your internal standard ratio is, is just completely off because your internal standard is inappropriate or not, or it's being suppressed differently, something along those lines. So that's where you need to focus with your, with your precision experiments. Uh, limited detection is actually your, kind of your stereotype, so there's no real difference there. Uh, but it is really important to kind of just keep in the back of your mind that you don't want your zero, your, your background noise, to exceed 20% of your, your peak area uh, for your low sample. And that's just kind of a general rule. Um, the interference is there's less focus on, on the serum indices and more focus on isobaric compounds, drugs, ion expression, that kind of stuff. And so that's pretty much the gist of my talk. So uh, I hope I've convinced you that quality metric monitoring is vital to understanding the performance of your assay. But when I came into my lab, it, there was a lot of uh, aversion to using the technology basically because they weren't familiar with it. There's a lot of hand-waving argument, arguments that kind of come up with, oh, that, that internal standard just dropped off because I needed to, you know, gut the instrument and change all the lines and, and you know, everything like that. Well, no, you just needed to opt alter your sample preparation. So it's just, it's really important to kind of understand how your assay is performing before you go live with it clinically and understand and have all your staff understand uh, that as well so that you don't end up with these kind of uh, biases against the technology or uh, these, these, what I would call extreme troubleshooting measures for simple problems. Um, so with, sample, uh, with adequate sample preparation and foresight, LC methods should be able to be incorporated to pretty much any workflow. So I've, I've worked in a hospital lab, I've worked in a reference lab now, and uh, the LCMS was applicable to both different tests, obviously, but um, it is actually it's doable. It's just you really do have to reinforce those, those differences between those high volume chemistry analyzers and, um, and the LCMS system. And, you know, LCMS expansion is happening, so um, understanding what these metrics are and how to use them clinically is more important than, than I would say ever. So uh, I guess there's really just one acknowledgement here is Heather Paul um, helped construct some of these slides, but I really did want to go out of my way to say thank you to the Waters Corporation and Lab Roots for having us. I'm excited and hopefully this was an informative situation and I guess I will open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sazade, Dr. Orton, and Dr. Boyd for your informative information, uh, presentation, sorry. Um, we're now gonna start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do, please do so now. Just click the ask a question box located in the far left of your screen. We already have several questions that have come in, um, but we will answer as many of the questions that have come in as we have time for before we, answer these questions. We do have a couple of poll questions that are going to be sent out to you now. Um, and while that's happening, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our first questions. So um, I think I'm going, to, I'm going to start with a question that came in about the identification of new synthetic illegal drugs. Um, this is a, a, a topic in toxicology that comes up quite often. So maybe Dr. Boyd, you can give us your experience on synthetic, uh, synthetic illegal drugs and measurement of those. Sure, yeah. So of course, these are um, a very tricky group because they're of course changing so quickly that everybody um, really struggles to try and keep up with them. Um, you know, some of these groups, we see, you know, 10, 12 new variants show up um, 
every year and you know every few months and so it, it's really quite tricky to keep up with them um, because by the time you know we validate a method uh, clinically and of course usually these are lab developed tests as uh, Dennis was talking about, um, it, it takes time for the lab to catch up, and by the time we have, usually they've gone to a new a new uh, variant of that drug, making us have to go back to the beginning and, and start everything again. So um, so it's definitely tricky. Um, typically, uh, probably the t- technique that's used the most or the strategy is, is using um, high-resolution mass spectrometry, um, which we didn't spend a ton of time on today, but um, essentially uh, gathering as much information about that sample as possible in an untargeted fashion. And I know, um, for example, uh, here in Alberta, our medical examiner will do that uh, using a TOF instrument and um, take those scans and then save them. And so that later on, when a new drug is uh, you know, identified or, you know, we hear about it on a listserv or something, um, they can go back and search those uh, old uh, spectra and look to see if those drugs were actually there. We just didn't know that they were there at the time or we hadn't, you know, identified them as a new synthetic drug. So it's definitely um, it's definitely a huge problem, probably something, like I said, that high-res mass spec is, is more um, able to deal with than perhaps the MRM triple quad information that we're using for some of our other assays. Um, but it's um, uh, going to be a continuous problem, um, like I said, because there's just more and more of these coming out all the time, and it's hard for us to, to keep up. Yes, I, I can imagine. <laughs> all right, thank you for that. Um, the next question that uh, I have here is um, regarding uh, does fixation time and sample age affect mass spec-based recognition of peptides and cancer histology applications? Uh, Dr. Orton? Uh, hi, yeah. Um, so I can basically, I should say this with a qualifying statement saying that I've never actually done this um, clinically, uh, but I know that when you're doing things like proteomic analysis uh, or genomic analysis when you're trying to extract RNA or, or DNA from, from fixed tissue, uh, the fixation time does influence it, does influence how, how well um, you can actually get analytes out. Uh, but you can you can probably work that out during the uh, the antigen retrieval type method that you're using, like whatever whatever method you're using to wash off the the paraffin or or remove the the formalin or anything like that. You can probably adapt your your procedure that way to uh, make it more robust and less influenced by the uh, fixation process. Great, thank you. I, and while you're on the phone, I still I have another question for you. Um, a question came in that. Uh, someone gets interference for steroids when patients are on supplements despite sample preparation. Uh, Is there any ideas how to deal with that? Ooh, steroids are tricky. Um, I think that uh, what what some people say to do is to have uh, either either multiple chromatographic methods or you can have different columns. Uh, If you can kind of redevelop or co-develop the method uh, using a separate column, like a column chromatography or a a column chemistry, then that would theoretically at least separate out the uh, the interferences uh, at least differently than your than your routine method. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sorry, we've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm trying to uh, get through them all. the next question I have is the association of 3D gels with multi tough MS a technique in disuse? I guess I could probably take that one too. Uh, so I come from a proteomics background. Uh, I did a discovery-based shotgun proteomics for my, uh, for my a project for my PhD. Uh, I used 2D gels. Um, using basically you know, the isoelectric focusing along the, the top, and then the uh, the gel based separation, the SDS page based separation on the uh, along the, the other axis. Um, I think the 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 movement is to go towards more of a, a mud pit technology, uh, and then so that basically allows you to label your sample uh, using the the tandem mass tags, and you can do quantitative analysis that way. Uh, the the gel based analysis used to use basically differential staining, so you would use like a uh, like a green tag on one and a red tag on another, and then you could see the differences in the gel uh, itself, and then you could excise those those spots and do a multi top analysis and get an idea of what was different. Uh, but I would say that technology is indeed in disuse. Uh, 
um, and that quantitative proteomics is kind of shifting more towards uh, the, the mud pit, the peptide-based peptide uh, methods. Thank you. Uh, another question um, about how to deal with ion suppression problems for most abundant proteins and phospholipids in serum for targeted analysis. Do you need to perform immunocapture or spin column? Lots of, lots of proteomics-based questions here. Um, yeah. I would say that yes, probably. Uh, so the most commonly used proteomic method in clinical, uh, in the clinical lab, maybe not the most common, but the most difficult uh, that, w that I know of is thyroglobulin, which is an enormous protein, and you have to digest it. And actually, you use what's called a cis-kappa approach. That's a stable isotope uh, enriched um, I can't remember the name of the acronym at the moment, um, but basically you use an antibody that's targeted against the peptide after you do your trips and digestion. So you're not enriching the protein, you're enriching the peptide. And I think that provides you a lot more specificity in the clinical method development. Um, in, the, um, in the more uh, discovery-based proteomics, yeah, spin columns are available. You can deplete uh, high abundance proteins. You can do molecular weight cutoff filters, differential pre precipitation. Uh, those kinds of things, get rid of all the immunoglobulins. Um, there's various strategies to try to deal with that, but uh, the CISGAPA is probably the most common in the, uh, in the clinical lab because you do get the most specificity from that. Great, thank you. Um, I guess we'll continue for a couple more questions. I know it's getting late, but um, what type of instrument-to-instrument -instrument variability would you expect to see when monitoring internal standard areas? Um, I guess that's that's me again. Unless Jessica, do you want to answer that one? Uh, no, go ahead. It's your part of the talk. Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't know if there's a there, there's a solid answer to this because there's always subtle variation between uh, different instruments. So we do have uh, paired analyzers in our in our lab, and we but we don't quantify the difference between the internal standard responses. I think it's important to kind of keep that in the back of your mind that you're. When you're validating your analyzer, you have to keep in mind the specific uh, performance of that one analyzer. I would never try to take the peak area from one and compare it to another. That said, they should be similar. You know, you should be within the same ballpark. I'm not going to say within 5% or 10%. I'm going to say, you know, they should be at least, um, they should perform kind of the same way between the two analyzers when you're looking at your analyte response ratios. So it's kind of hard to answer that question uh, specifically. <laughs> I would say that they need to be similar, but not the same. Right, great, thank you. Um, so Dr. Boyd, why is multi multiple reaction monitoring used in so prevalently, prevalently, but I can't talk, in clinical chemistry assays? Yeah, I think um, part of the reason that it's used so prevalently for chemistry is that it uh, is a really strong technique for doing what we would call targeted analysis. And I kind of alluded to this in the last uh, question that was asked, but um, often, you know, you can think about running your mass spec in a targeted way in that you know what you're looking for and you can tell the instrument just to look for those things, or you can run it in, in an untargeted where we're just trying to collect as much information across the whole sample as possible. Um, you know, there's advantages either way. Um, in the case of those, uh, you know, emerging drugs of abuse, um, it, you know, is potentially more useful to collect all of that information to try and make sure we don't miss anything. But for many of the analytes that we're doing in chemistry, um, we know what analyte we want to look at. Um, and you know, therefore we know the molecular weight and are, should be able to figure out its fragmentation pattern during method validation. And so by running an MRM, we're able to really, you know, up the specificity because we are looking at that, that uh, fragment transition, um, but also, um, you know, help reduce some of that background noise because we tell the instrument only to look at certain things. Um, and um, so for things like, you know, our metanephrine assay, you know, we know we're looking for metanephrine nor metanephrine. We don't necessarily care about all the other stuff in the sample. So um, I think that's one of the one of the strengths. The other thing is, of course, once you kind of have one method running an MRM, then you, um, you know, it's it's perhaps not as much a leap for staff to understand what you're doing. Um, uh, if you run another MRM, even if it's for a very different um, uh, analyte class, such as a, a TDM or something like that. So, um, and then third, of course, you can do that kind of scan mode very um, 
I guess, uh, easily or efficiently on something like a triple quad, which of course puts the instrumentation in a price point that uh, many labs now are able to uh, to purchase that kind of instrumentation rather than going for something that's um, maybe overpowered for the analysis that you want to do. Perfect, thank you. Um, I think I want to um, take one last question um, because we are quite over time and the questions that we didn't get to, we will we will answer them, I promise you. Uh, we will do that by email with the email that you sent to us. But last question is going to be more of an educational question uh, for Dr. Sazade. Of the four scientists develop um, the methods for ionization of large molecules at the same time, why if, sorry, if the four scientists developed the methods for ionization of large molecules at the same time, why did only two of the scientists receive the Nobel Prize? Thank you, Ben. Uh, this is a question that actually has been on the minds of many scientists in the field. Indeed, uh, uh, many of the uh, recognized chemists, especially in Europe, uh, who were invited to the Nobel event uh, did not go. And the reason they didn't go, they said that uh, uh, prize, uh, Nobel Prize went to the wrong address. They meant it should have gone to uh, Dr. Hillenkamp and uh, um, uh, his uh, colleague, Dr. Keras, in Germany. Uh, but the, uh, I, I, I'm going to quote Dr. Uh, Norden, who was the chairman of the Nobel Prize Committee for Chemistry. <clears throat> he said that uh, Tanaka was honored because he was the first to develop an idea that changed other people's way of thinking. There are other people who also said that uh, Tanaka did not only uh, uh, invent a new way of ionization, it was also, he, was, he also invented the way to really set up the instrument, adjusting the detector. It wasn't just the ionization. But in general, I should say that many people were upset, and the MAUDI, the method that was developed by Dr. Helen Kemp and uh, Paris, has been used uh, far more than the method that was developed by Dr. Kanaka. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sazade. All right, so um, I. I would like to thank the audience for joining us today. I, again, we will get to the rest of the questions that are in here, uh, but we are running a little bit over time. Um, but I would like to thank you for your, your attendance and the interesting questions and your engagement. Um, I'd also like to thank our, our presenters for their time today and this important um, research. We also like to thank Lab Roots in association with us, here, with us here at Waters Corporation for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share it, um, that email with your colleagues and anybody who missed uh, today's live event. Thank you again to our presenters, and thank you to you for, for joining us today.